I'm very pleased to welcome you all for this uh, IIEA webinar, and we're very honored today to be joined by Bertia Hearn, former Taoiseach, who has been generous enough to take time out from his very busy schedule to speak with us. He will provide an address where he'll consider the future of Anglo-Irish relations, something on which I think he's particularly well qualified uh, to pronounce. Uh, and we know that the context is, is, is in extremely complicated. The, the Northern Irish Assembly election saw a historic shift in public opinion within Northern Ireland with a fractured unionist vote leading to Sinn Féin becoming the largest party in the Assembly. And additionally, the UK government's announcement of legislation to set aside aspects or indeed very large parts of the Northern Ireland Protocol puts further pressure on the relationship between the two governments and the delays and delays the finding of workable solutions. So the, the context could not be, this could not be a better moment for uh, Bertie Ahern to share his thoughts with us. Uh, he will speak for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll go to question and answer with our audience. Uh, some housekeeping points, you're pretty familiar with this stuff from Zoom now, but you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. And please feel free to send in your questions throughout the session as they occur to you, and then we will put them uh, to Bertie once he has finished his presentation. You can also participate in the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. And finally, a, a reminder that today's presentation and the question and answer are both on the record. Um, I was going to say earlier that Bertie Ahern was a man who really needs no introduction, but that is not going to stop me from providing a very brief introduction, Bertie. Uh, he served as Taoiseach from 1997 to 2008, leading Fianna Fáil into government on three successive elections in 1997, 2002, and 2007. He was first elected to the Dáil in 1977 for Dublin Finglas, and he went on to represent Dublin Central from 1981 to 2011. Among other roles, he previously served as Minister for Labour, Minister for Finance, Minister for Arts and Culture and the Gaeltacht, and Minister for Industry and Commerce. And a defining moment, of course, of his period as Taoiseach and in Irish history was the successful negotiation of the Good Friday Agreement between the British and Irish governments and the political parties in Northern Ireland, of which he was one of the major architects. Bertie, over to you, please. Thank you very much, David, and, and thank you for everyone that has uh, joined in on this uh, IIEA um, webinar. Um, just to go back, uh, I, I'm going to hit a, a few dates just fairly quickly to take the context of what we've been dealing with um, over the last six years. Uh, two days short now of six years, 23rd of, of June 2016, uh, the referendum was held in the United Kingdom. Uh, to leave the European Union, which won 52-48. And uh, after that, there was three or four months of considerable debate about how the government would present that, which they did in Lancaster House on the 17th of January of 2017, uh, the UK to leave the single market, uh, but not only that, but also to leave uh, the customs union, which at that stage, because it had not been an issue uh, in the referendum campaign, whatever, or in the t t television radio debates. That was a surprise at the time. And then in the intervening period uh, of whether there would be a, a deal with the uh, EU or, or not, um, the, the government more or less said, the British government, that no deal uh, would be better than a bad one. So in the 11th of March, 2017, uh, Parliament uh, gave a power to trigger Article 50, uh, which laid out the process of, of leaving. And on the 29th of March, um, when uh, that was triggered in the, in the vote, and of course, then uh, there was an election held fairly quickly at Theresa May, uh, which she did not need to have, but she, she wanted a, a mandate as they prepared to leave the European Union. Uh, but that election did not go uh, particularly well. Uh, and um, they lost a majority at the Tory uh, government. And um, then a few months passed without much happening. And 22nd of September 2017, uh, the uh, British government in a Florence speech laid out uh, what Brexit would, would cost and uh, what, what price to leave. And, um, and then in December, 
uh, there was the significant progress, uh, which was what the EU said was the position that they required uh, to leave. Uh, that was passed just at that Christmas time. Uh, and uh, the backstop was part of, of that deal. Uh, and the backstop, of course, uh, was again to deal with the Northern Ireland and the border uh, situation uh, and the fact that we were the, uh, the border into the uh, single market and the European border. Um, so as we went into the 2018, uh, that bill that gave you EU uh, leave uh, to leave became law. Uh, and in the following month, uh, the cabinet agreed the future relationship white paper, uh, which again, of course, uh, dealt with the, the issue of the backstop. Um, and then Sir David Davies um, resigned, who was the Brexit secretary, and Boris followed them within a few days. Uh, so um, that led to all those debates in, in the Commons, um, where three times or four, uh, the UK government, Theresa May's government, failed to get uh, the um, proposals passed. Uh, so, um, and within months, uh, unfortunately, um, she was gone and uh, her government were gone. Uh, Boris Johnson uh, came in and uh, the discussions had continued on. The backstop um, moved um, the talks between the Taoiseach then, Leo Bradker, uh, and Boris uh, in November um, of, of 2020. Uh, or 2019, and that led to um, the protocol coming into existence. And of course, the importance of that was that straight away there was an election uh, and Boris with the protocol on board and the protocol went before the people, uh, it, it was passed. So um, we've spent now the last uh, few years really since that period uh, arguing uh, over uh, the protocol. Uh, the protocol, um, let us just for a moment dwell on it. It's an integral part of what the um, European Union United Kingdom withdrawal agreement is, a result of four years of very difficult negotiations, uh, mainly at official level, but also at ministerial level. And there were compromises on, on all sides, and the protocol uh, safeguarded the, uh, the Good Friday Agreement, uh, including ensuring no hard border on the island of border. Uh, in the islands of Ireland, uh, the, uh, it protected the single market and Ireland's place in it. And the, uh, as I said, the British government brought an election on that, so they, they had a mandate for that agreement. Uh, the protocol came into operation uh, in January uh, 2021. And difficulties in relation to its implementation have really been ongoing since that date. It wasn't long that it was in until the difficulty started. And that has led right up to the difficulties of, of recent days. Um, it has also uh, badly damaged the EU-UK relationship, um, not to mind uh, the Irish-UK uh, relationship. Uh, the UK unilateral actions in, in March of last year uh, led to the Commission uh, beginning infringement proceedings, which were then stalled and have now been uh, reenacted again in, in the last number of days. Nevertheless, by the end of June last year, the EU agreed to a, a UK request to extend a grace period related to chilled meats and um, made clear its commitment to ensure the uh, continuity uh, of medicine supplies from Great Britain, uh, which was the big issue uh, at this time last year uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, the UK government July command paper, uh, which was uh, set out uh, by Lord Frost, uh, sought um, substantial revisions of the protocol, uh, ending checks uh, on Great Britain and Northern Ireland movements and not proceeding to Ireland, ending the European Court of Justice uh, justification uh, on the operation of EU law in Northern Ireland, and allowing uh, EU-UK uh, market regulation in Northern Ireland, ending the protocol uh, state aid provision these are all issues that um, arose at that command paper and are now in the legislation uh, of last week. And while re rejecting uh, moves to renegotiating the text, uh, the uh, EU, uh, Marcus Rovich, has, has continued 
uh, to engage with the UK in an effort to find creative solutions uh, for issues affecting people on the ground in Northern Ireland. And uh, last September, uh, the European Commission Vice President paid a, a very well-received visit uh, to Northern Ireland, where he engaged uh, for several days uh, with political business and civic representatives, um, and particularly focusing on uh, hearing directly uh, the concerns that citizens and business had with Brexit, had with the protocol. Um, I think the Commission developed a package of proposals to ease implementation of the protocol based on, on the back of those meetings and, and presented those uh, on the 13th of October last. Unfortunately, uh, David, there's been very little negotiations um, since then. Um, just the, on the eve um, of, and I think it's, it's very important to just to, to look back on this now, on the eve of those EU proposals, uh, on the 12th of October, Lord Frost stated that the UK um, had a shared legal text on an amended protocol uh, with the Commission. Uh, he also outlined his expectation uh, for a short, intensive EU-UK talks uh, in coming weeks, uh, and signaling the willingness to use Article 16 in early November if talks did not achieve resolution. Uh, he had cited a, an increase in cross-border trade on the island of Ireland as another UK uh, protocol concern, as well as highlighting the uh, oversight role of the ECJ as a red line. Uh, the Commission uh, had been clear that the ECJ's role uh, cannot be uh, revisited, but they had also said that they were prepared uh, to negotiate. I think uh, it's a very important, I think, now to look back on, on what Lord Frost had said at that stage, because I think most of his, his proposals from the command paper to that uh, speech that he made in October are really reflected in the bill of last week. Um, uh, there is, is some talk over the last week that these were new issues, but I think it has been, I, me I mention it because it has been clear uh, that this has effectively uh, been the, the British government's agenda uh, since the protocol uh, was actually uh, negotiated in, in the first place. And uh, my evidence is the facts that I've outlined. It's not, it's neither hearsay um, or, or dreamt up uh, by me or others. Uh, the only sustainable way to deal with issues relating to protocol uh, is through the structures provided in the withdrawal agreement. Um, I, I, I would have thought any negotiators or competent negotiators would agree with that. And the proposals brought forward by the Commission, uh, I think it, it is a view represents a, a real opportunity for Northern Ireland uh, and require um, serious and constructive engagement from the UK. Uh, I think any uh, unilateral action, as, as we have seen last year, um, we, we, we've seen it on at least one occasion or two occasions, once with the agreement of the, uh, the European Union in retrospect, uh, and again uh, last week on the legislation, uh, could create only further instability and uh, be deeply unhelpful in building the relationships and trust a partnership that is central to the implementation of the, uh, the protocol, and not just with, the, with this uh, country, but uh, with the European Union, uh, which was set out uh, in the agreement that the, the UK and the EU had entered uh, into from discussions in 2018-2019. Uh, the UK's international reputation as a trustworthy partner is also uh, an issue. And uh, in Northern Ireland, Brexit uh, continues to exasperate political tensions within the executive uh, in various stages. Last September, North-South cooperation ceased, um, in which effectively means there has been no operational of the Good Friday Agreement uh, since, since, last, since late last summer. Um, on the first few days of February, um, the, uh, unfortunately, the uh, executive ceased uh, altogether. Um, it now looks as if that could be a, a, a prolonged uh, period of, of suspension yet again after what happened in the earlier period. So at the same time, I think it is clear that many in Northern Ireland, particularly in the business community, want the protocol to work well, uh, see the benefits of it, 
uh, they, they see that this is, is a help to them. The protocol presents real opportunities for Northern Ireland, dual access to both the single market uh, and 450 uh, million people in the rest of the uh, UK or the internal market. Um, uh, and of course, surveys show that two thirds of businesses in Northern Ireland uh, see the opportunities uh, in the, um, the realities of, of being in the single market and the opportunities of being able to trade with the UK, trade with uh, the Republic, trade with uh, the rest of the, uh, the EU. But it, it has created stability and there's no uh, doubt about that. Uh, the European Commission proposals on the protocol on Northern Ireland, just to uh, briefly touch on some of them because uh, they're still at the heart of some of the discussions. European Commission's um, package of proposals um, they put in place innovative uh, and durable solutions to the issues raised by citizens and business in Northern Ireland. And they uh, dealt with a, a number of the, of the key issues. I'm not going to go through them all, but many of the, uh, the contentious issues of a year ago uh, were dealt with in those October proposals. Uh, the SPS uh, issues the Commission uh, proposed a bespoke Northern Ireland Pacific solution offering a simplification of the processes for uh, a broad range of uh, retail goods for sale uh, to end customers in, in shops in Northern Ireland. And those measures uh, could remove up to 80% uh, of the uh, identity and physical SBS checks for, for such goods. And uh, it would also follow the uh, substantial uh, reductions in paperwork for qualifying uh, mixed loads uh, with documentation uh, covering each uh, relevant vehicle uh, rather than uh, each set of goods within the vehicle. Uh, that, again, I think was a legitimate argument uh, of, of Northern Ireland business people um, and in fairness uh, to the EU, they dealt with that. On customs, uh, the Commission uh, proposed uh, expanding the, uh, the scope, uh, the beneficiaries and products, um, the covenants and benefits of the protocols, goods, uh, and that were not at risk of entering the EU uh, concept. And I, I think this could reduce the required uh, customs processes by by half, and I think um, in the latest paper by the Commission, which was published last week, one of the two papers published by the Commission, they spelled out precisely how that would work, uh, and I think that's been well covered in national media. And of course, the other contentious item uh, of last year, which I was involved in some of the meetings with business people in the north and uh, civic leaders on medicines, the Commission papers. Um, note the intention to amend EU laws so that regulatory uh, functions can continue to be uh, performed in Great Britain on behalf of Northern Ireland and uh, meaning relevant companies would not have to uh, establish uh, new capacity infrastructure or regulatory functions uh, in the EU or Northern Ireland uh, and wholesalers can continue uh, to supply uh, Great Britain for Northern Ireland and Great Britain can continue um, uh, acting as, as a hub for the supply of generic medicines. That's been implemented. Um, there's hardly a word about uh, that now. So um, I, I think, uh, David, there's been a significant progress along, along the way by the European Union. And yes, I think it is fair to say on balance that there are still some outstanding issues. There are some issues where veterinary uh, and a professional veterinary um, individual is necessary to do checks. Um, and there are some areas that would not require a renegotiation of the protocol to deal with. But uh, from my reading of it, and not to give a biased view of it, but it seems to me that the EU have clearly given um, since last October and in the papers of, of in their two documents of last week that they're prepared to deal with these issues. There, there are issues in the protocol where they've said they can't negotiate and um, uh, they're all uh, familiar uh, issues. I think we, we know them. There's the state aids one, there's the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the issues of um, the, uh, the European Commission, uh, Committee of Justice, the Court of Justice, uh, and there's some uh, tax clauses where, where they've said 
uh, that these are within the protocol and they won't negotiate the protocol. But I think it is an unfair statement to say that the EU have not been prepared uh, to be flexible. Uh, they have outlined that very clearly uh, where they're prepared to be flexible. The difficulty, and as somebody said the other day, was that the vice president said, let's call a spade a spade. Uh, the reality is that the negotiations since October have been little or none. Um, the, Lord Frost left on the 18th of December, and Liz Truss took up the position. There was a meeting in February. There's been very little meeting since. Uh, so uh, that has led to the unfortunate position where uh, the Irish government um, in recent days uh, have said, and I, I, I just want to quote the UK government's intention to table legislation to unilaterally uh, uh, disapply elements of the protocol is deeply disappointing. Uh, threats to break international agreements and international law cannot achieve sustainable solutions and only uh, serve to undermine a trust and partnership that Taoiseach has made clear in his words, unilateral action uh, to set aside a, a solemn agreement would be deeply uh, damaging. It would be a historic low point signaling a uh, a disregard for essential principles of law. So it has all been extraordinarily uh, negative. Um, my understanding is that at official level, uh, a parliamentary level, a ministerial level, and at heads of state level, Boris and, and the Taoiseach, um, a UK Prime Minister and the Taoiseach, that relationships are, are, are poor, uh, let's put it no, no stronger uh, than that. And I think this is, this is very disappointing. Over the last uh, 30, 35 years now, uh, since John Major and Albert Reynolds and followed on um, in, in, in my time uh, with Tony Blair and, and, and Gordon Brown and followed on again by David Cameron um, and Theresa May, uh, who, who was, I think it should be noted, and I would like to say was very helpful and really lost her job in the end uh, because she stuck by um, uh, an agreement that was made. Uh, and uh, lost her position and 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 lost her majority uh, on, on that on that position. So um, I think this is the, uh, the, the, the these are the difficult periods. I don't want to to go on uh, outside my my twenty minutes, David. But uh, I think we are in a position now uh, where uh, the atmosphere is is, is toxic. Uh, I do believe that the only way uh, I spent my my career. Uh, dealing with negotiations, difficult and otherwise. Uh, I do think uh, in all negotiations, uh, it is possible uh, to find solutions. I, I never believe things are, are impossible, but it takes two sides to negotiate. Uh, it takes the European Union and the UK in this instance. Uh, it certainly takes, um, I think, leadership by the top uh, to, to do this. Uh, the legislation of last week, which actually disapplies nearly the entire protocol, uh, is, is very unhelpful to that. Uh, I had been saying up until last week's legislation uh, that uh, people have to uh, sit down and, and try and get back to a position, what the protocol was meant to do, uh, to uh, make sure we know land border in the island of, Ir of Ireland, but also to remove the concept of a sea border. I think that language was always un unhelpful, particularly to unionists and loyalist people. And we have to endeavor to find solutions uh, to keep trade moving between the UK and Northern Ireland. I think there's, a, there's an argument um, for that. I know Geoffrey Donaldson has particularly highlighted that aspect of the agreement, and I understand uh, his concerns on that. Um, checking goods from the UK uh, including Northern Ireland, must be checked by uh, EU food standards. I don't think it's possible to have dual regulatory systems. Um, why or how could the European Union be dealing with trade deals all over the world uh, and then not be following uh, EU standards of health? Um, uh, and I recall that it was a, an Irish commissioner, David Byrne, uh, who was in, put in place to, to try to regulate uh, uh, high food standards and it is in the interests of every European citizen including in Northern Ireland and if, if not the rest of the UK uh, that we have high um, food standards for all our health safeties um, and uh, so the, 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 these, these are issues but 
Uh, my view is you still have to go back to the uh, negotiating table. Uh, if you were to get to a position uh, that the bill is passed um, uh, and that there is no checks uh, at all um, coming into Northern Ireland, that is a position that isn't sustainable by the European Union. Um, that would raise the question um, uh, of uh, what happens to the single market in Northern Ireland. Uh, that would become an inevitable uh, question. Uh, um, then the argument is where are the checks done for the Republic of Ireland? Are they done in ports in Europe? Are they, um, if there's no land border, where does that go? Um, that would ultimately raise the question of the single market in the Republic. So all these things are slippery slopes. And uh, I don't think any of them are necessary. Uh, I think the, uh, the fundamental position is that uh, the UK and the EU should get back to the negotiating table and uh, try to resolve their, their differences. The green and red lines seem to be something that should be explored further. Um, and I think the vice president um, who, even though he's had to, Marek Skovic, he's, he's had to deal with several uh, secretaries of state or se several secretaries for Brexit. Um, he, he fully understands the issues on all sides. Uh, I do not think he's in any way partisan. I think he's genuinely trying to find solutions. Um, and I think it is good that we have somebody in, you, in, the, EU, in the EU side uh, who is so familiar with the arguments on all sides including unionists, loyalists, republicans, nationalists, business people, um, to try and resolve these issues. And uh, I do feel that Jeffrey Donaldson is somebody uh, who, who will not want to indefinitely see the institutions down. He is a supporter of the peace process and the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement. So uh, there we have it, David. I, I you know, I, I'm an optimist by nature. I'm a negotiator by profession. Uh, and I do believe um, that we don't have to hit the doomsday uh, and hopefully we can get back to a negotiating table, but it does require uh, leadership uh, by everybody to do that.